the body is such an intelligent uh, creation. I am always so amazed at, at how it talks to us. Every part of our physical body is only a reflection of what's going on beyond the body, beyond the physical. This is what we call metaphysical. Una dintre cele mai influente personalități ale continentului nord-american continuă seria Digipedia Plus. Liz Bourbeau este autoarea unei filozofii de viață numite Ecutonco, ascultă corpul, care a generat o adevărată mișcare la nivel mondial. Destinul lui Liz Bourbeau s-a schimbat în anii 80. Părea a fi atunci un om împlinit, era cel mai bun director de vânzări din America de Nord, era căsătorită și avea trei copii minunați. Dar nu avea încă răspunsul la întrebarea ce îi împiedică pe oameni să fie fericiți. Atunci ea a început pe cont propriu un studiu de mare anvergură în urma căruia în 1982 a apărut prima ei carte, bestsellerul Ecut Tonko. Ascultă-ți corpul conține o filozofie de viață ce vizează în același timp binele fizic, emoțional și mental, precum și legătura dintre ele. Volumul a devenit bestseller încă de la prima ediție, cu vânzări de peste 800.000 de, de exemplare. Succesul uriaș al cărții a determinat-o să înființeze un centru prin care să împărtășească și altor oameni viziunea ei despre adevăratele cauze ale bolilor și suferințelor. De-a lungul timpului, peste 40.000 de, de cazuri au primit consiliere și peste 80.000 de, de cursanți s-au perfecționat în atelierele lui Liz Bourbeau. În acest timp, ea a continuat să scrie despre cele cinci răni care ne împiedică să fim noi înșine sau despre cum putem să facem să ne iubim cu adevărat. Până acum, Liz Bourbeau are 21 de cărți publicate și traduse în 20 de limbi. Vânzările au depășit cifra de 3 milioane de exemplare. Ca urmare, metoda ei terapeutică este apreciată și implementată în 22 de țări. Cei care au aplicat teoria Ecut Tonko și-au dorit să o cunoască personal pe Liz Bourbeau. Acum ea ține conferințe și ateliere în întreaga lume. Una dintre destinațiile sale recente a fost chiar România. Deși a stat foarte puțin în București, echipa Digipedia Plus a avut privilegiul să primească din partea terapeutei de origine canadienă o lecție particulară de Ecut Tonko. Welcome, Liz Bourbeau, and uh, thank you very much for being here. I know how busy you are, but still you made your time. Thank you very much. Well, it's my pleasure. Uh, to quote the name of one of your best-selling books, who are you, Liz Bourbeau? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. <laughs> well, I'm just uh, a woman, just like everybody else, who, uh, who always asks questions. Since I'm a little girl, you know, I, I'm Mrs. Question. I wanted to know everything. I'm a, I have a soul of a searcher, and, and I never had answers to my questions when I was young, when I went to school, especially with, with the nuns in the convent, you know, with the Catholic nuns and what they were telling me about God and things like that. I didn't like all this fear and everything. So it, I probably decided right there and then that one day I would have answers. So I started in about in my 20s to um, to search everywhere and I, everything interests me. So I've I've taken, I don't know how many workshops in the last 40 years I've been doing uh, more, than, more than 40 years for research. And um, it's uh, little by little, everything came to me and, uh, and I started to put things together. I understood things different ways. And uh, one day, uh, 32 years ago, uh, I had uh, a dream. Uh, where uh, I saw myself teaching where what I had discovered about different things, uh, aches and pains, that uh, there's a hidden message be behind that and uh, how to know yourself with your, the way you eat and all kinds of things. I had made synthesis and, uh, and I, it was so exciting when I had that dream. I said, oh my God, this is what I really want to do. But I was working in sales then and 
Working in sales, I was uh, very, very successful in sales. I was number one of Canada, United States, uh, really working hard and uh, seven days a week while having children and uh, I've always been very busy anyway. And um, in sales, you have to be like a positive thinking. So for the first 15 years of my research, I was very much into positive thinking, which was the big uh, fashion then, you know, because uh, my first book I bought on that was uh, about uh, 20, uh, 45 years ago. There was only one book, The Power of the Subconscious Mind, that was available in English only. I started with that. I was so excited about this uh, power we had subconsciously and everything, but I had not touched the spiritual part of the work, so it's uh, it's later on in my search that I started to to think that it's not enough just to to be positive and to make affirmations and and I realized I was being rigid, I was controlling my life, which was good for me because I was a very rigid person, always very perfectionist, and and things had to be this way and and. Um, I, actually, that was the main reason for my first divorce because I was too rigid at, I, and too controlling with my husband and three children. And uh, it's after I, my divorce that I put everything together and it was funny, it was through, through uh, writing down what I was eating because I had just gained weight. I wanted to know why I gained weight and I wrote down and I saw how rigid I was in my way of eating. So then I made the association. I was the same in my other aspects of my life. When I had this dream, uh, uh, it was a big decision because I had been in sales for 15 years. I was divorced with three teenagers and um, I'm making a lot of money and I, I quit everything and I decided to start my school 31 years ago and uh, I cannot say that it was easy but I'm a very um, very determined person very enthusiastic and uh, um, well organized and um, uh, very perseverant also you know I don't let go if I have a goal and I think that's one of my greatest strength uh, why I built this uh, school and because if I have a goal that goes wow inside of me I know that I it, it's it, it's it's a need of my soul I need that I need to reach that goal so I'm ready to do anything and to sacrifice anything and I always keep my goal in mind so no matter what happens you know if something an obstacle happens I look after it, but I always keep my goal in mind. This, this is one of the secrets, I think, of life, to, for people to, to know what they want, where they want to go, and just aim there all the time. No matter what it takes or how long it takes, but at least you, you feel that you're getting closer to something. What does it mean to listen to your body? We have a physical body, emotional body, and mental body. So it, to listen to the needs of the physical, mental, and emotional is one thing, but listening to your body is listening to the signs that your physical body or physical environment is giving you uh, to attract your attention to the fact that you are not listening to the needs of your body. Because as soon as it starts to hurt, physically, if you start feeling anger or emotion or ill at ease or you know you don't feel good inside physically uh, emotionally or mentally right away this is a sign that you are not listening to the needs the real needs of your body at first you have to you know you have to make a little effort to, to start thinking about that but uh, to be more aware but after a while it comes by itself like if I have a little accident I just bang myself uh, uh, my knee or something right away it comes automatically uh oh what was what was I thinking you know right away I know the guilt I was feeling guilty about something and I'm punishing myself by banging my knee on the on the, on the furniture yeah when did you first listen to your body? When was the first time you say, aha, uh -huh, this is it? Well, it, it's when um, I had uh, 
put the weight on and uh, I woke up one morning because I went on diet like everybody else but I, I hated diets after a few months of that I didn't like it and because I would lose weight put it back on in it so one morning I woke up with a wonderful idea brilliant idea to write down everything I need I eat and this is when I really started to listen to my needs and I, I saw that I was not uh, I would eat the, the chicken before it goes bad I would eat because it was time to eat I would eat because I was going out in case I would be hungry a little later or, I, I or because you were nervous uh, yes or emotion if I was angry at somebody I would eat more or so if uh, then I started to really be aware of am I really hungry and what am I if it said yes then if I wasn't sure, I knew I was not hungry. If it said yes, and I'd say, okay, what am I hungry for? Mm, I would try to, to, to feel, you know, something hard, soft, or salty or not. And, and that's when I started to really listen to my physical needs, just for, for, uh, for eating. But then gradually, I, at the same time, I started to listen to my other needs. If somebody asked me for a favor, before I would say yes because I was afraid to, to hurt the person or I would feel guilty if I didn't help that person. And I would, I would say yes when I, my need was to say no. Then I started to say no. I was more aware of my children's needs. I would, be, I would respect their needs more. Before, if they were not hungry, I would say, look, I'm not a servant here. I made the meal, so you got to eat now, you know. <laughs> and they said, we're not hungry. I said, I, eat now. That's, I can't make 25 miles, meals a day. So, you know, this is the, and now I say, okay, you're not hungry now. You know, you can eat later. And, but I'm not making a meal. You just go in the fridge and eat what, whatever you find, you know. So I started to listen to my other needs and my children's needs. And the, the, then I, I made the connection with that. To listen to your needs is just a show of love to yourself. When you don't listen to your needs, because you don't love yourself. And, uh, and I realized that had been the big problem with my first husband. Because I didn't love myself enough, I was expecting him to love me, to compensate the way I wanted. Not the way that he knew how to give love. But his way was not, you know, was not what I had imagined it was supposed to be. <laughs> What does it mean to be healthy? To be healthy is just to be feel good in your body, feel good, f have because um, healthy has to go in the three bodies again. Not just because some people, you know, they do a lot of exercises and and they have a perfect body and good energy, but inside everything is going wrong. So the minute they stop exercising, the body starts to go, f you know, soft or not good. So if you re really want to be healthy, you've got to do it in the three bodies. So just, well, to be healthy means listening to your body, to your three bodies and feeling, feeling good, happy about living. And in contrast, the disease is? Well, the disease is a signal. It's our God self, our inner God that uh, when we have not listened to lots of messages we've had before because we always we start with mental messages emotional mens messages uh, you know we're not feeling good or uh, we have fears you know like our mind is busy but those messages are very subtle so like you said before we we are very busy we're running around so we we don't even we're not even aware of these messages so when after many years, many years of messages, uh, we have not listened yet to that we are, we are going against love, against the plan of our life, then finally it attacks the physical body. By the time it gets to the physical, it means it's more urgent now that you look at, there's a way of thinking in you, in, you, in your life that hurts you as much as the, the disease that you just uh, found, you know, that you have. So people who have very serious disease, it means that they've had many, many messages and many other physical messages to smaller physical messages, but they just ignore them. And then one day it's, we get one big message. To, it's like um, the red light that you uh, 
appears in your car, you start your car, you see the red light, you know that it's warning you about something. But if you, you, you ignore it or it bothers you, you take the light out, well, one day you get a much bigger message. It's, it's, it's similar to that, what we do with ourselves. We, we ignore things because we're too busy with our uh, uh, just uh, having things or doing things and we forgot about the being. You are uh, making in your books connections like uh, if we have a stomach ache, uh, it means uh, fear of losing someone. Kidneys problems mean that uh, you are not expressing yourself or keeping something for yourself. How do you make the connection between the, the actual visible things like uh, the signs, the symptoms and the emotional? Uh, Actually, I wrote a book on that, on the big one, the, your body says love yourself with about 500 aches and pains and diseases. There's about a thousand altogether. I put, took the, the ones that are most known. And, and I have a big uh, medical encyclopedia at home, 36 big books. I went through all that and uh, I picked the disease I wanted to write in my book. And, and, and this is what um, I do best is uh, to see the metaphysical expression to what is physical. Like if, um, if I have a stomach ache and I say, okay, describe what's the description in the physical, like because you, with your stomach, what's the description? Well, I can't digest anymore. I have problem with my digestion. So you see, I transfer that to other, to uh, physical, uh, emotional and mental. So then I would say to myself, who is the person that you cannot digest right now? So see, it's, it's not the food, it's not the cucumber you are allergic to, you can't digest. It, there's somebody here around you that you don't digest. If you don't digest the person, why is that? It's because you are criticizing the person, you are not accepting that person the way they are, and um, they, because you do the same to yourself. So you see, that attracts your attention to be more loving all the time. Can any disease be linked, traced to its uh, psychological case or um, cause or uh, emotional cause? Like any disease we have can be traced back? Yes. Yes, I believe strongly, 100% of all diseases, like, uh, I, I have that question many times by doctors, like, one day, it was funny, it was a dentist, you know, was uh, taking a workshop at the workshop, and he said, I can understand, you know, the stomach digestion, if you have sore legs because you're afraid to, to walk, to go ahead and maybe plan a new future, um, you're afraid for, the, yeah. so, he says, but teeth, no, I don't believe it. I don't believe that our teeth are not. They simply don't brush their teeth, <laughs> that's it. Yeah. And uh, so it was so funny, you know, because he had deci already decided this part does not work like that. And I said, I'm sorry, but uh, you, uh, it, it, uh, every part of our physical body is only a reflection of what's going on beyond the body, beyond the physical. This is what we call metaphysical, uh, beyond the physical. And, um, and it, the body is such an intelligent uh, creation. I am always so amazed at, at how it talks to us. It's, uh, I mean, I've been doing that for, you know, for a long time. And I'm always, always amazed and enthused and very, very in awe of this uh, intelligence because it attracts your attention with the part of your body that has a connection with the way of thinking. So if you're afraid to go ahead or you're afraid from when you think about the future, uh, well, you're not gonna have a, a, a shoulder ache, you're gonna have legs, you know? But if you put somebody on your shoulder, you're, you're trying to control somebody else's life, you think it's your obligation to make that person happy, you're gonna have a backache, you put the person on your back. So down, down deep, it's, it's very simple. It's simple and it's very logical. What about diseases that uh, modern medicine still doesn't understand, like uh, cancer? Do they also, uh, can they also be traced back and question, can they be cured from the inside? Oh yes, everything, everything. We, it, well, it's easy for me to say because, you know, I've been teaching uh, all over the world and I've, I've maybe met about 100,000 people and I have 
heard so many stories of miracles and we have files and files and files at, at the office of people that wrote, write us letters just saying thank you because they've just been to the doctor, they've just had another x-ray and the long problem they had this doesn't exist anymore, it just disappeared and the doctors are, don't know what to do because this person had to have an operation, it shows on the x-ray the, the problem with the lungs and you know, three months later, this woman started to work on herself. And before the operation, I, we say to the people, ask for another x-ray, just for fun, you know, mm -hmm. or another examination. And they, so they had to say, we must have made a mistake. Maybe we didn't x-ray the right lung, or maybe it was the left lung. And they, they always, and they look at the two x-ray, and they can't believe it, that it's gone. So what they don't understand, they don't talk about it because uh, they, they like to have an answer to everything, you know, a, a scientific answer. But I'll tell you, I, am, I have many, many doctors as friends. I work with a lot of doctors who send customers to my workshops. Uh, they all agree that uh, they cannot cure. They can never tell or promise one of their patients, we will cure you. They're, here's what we know can help you, but they can, uh, they can take away the symptoms sometimes. If you have a headache, you take a pill, but they cannot promise that the headache will never come back. And uh, so this is why we, we always tell everybody, you can take all the pills you want. You can go, go and see your doctor or any kind of medicine of your choice. It's okay because I don't believe it's intelligent to, to hurt. You know, if, if, it, if it hurts you, something hurts you, do something about the pain. But at the same time, go beyond that. Go and see what your body is telling you. So you are being helped in every aspect. The, the doctor looks after you physically and you look after you, yourself beyond the physical. How? You're, you said something very interesting. She worked with herself. Well, with all the different things that we teach in the workshops, you know, like I have many, many tools, many uh, that I created with the, just questions. People ask themselves questions and... Um, are we subconsciously programmed? Do we have like um, a program that is building uh, subconsciously since we are very small, for instance? And because mentally or what we know consciously, uh, we can deal with or we can understand. But is subconscious playing a big part in oh, disease? Yes, because uh, um, according to the psychological studies, uh, people right now on Earth are conscious between five to 10% of what's going on inside. So that means that 90 to 95% of all the fears you have, the beliefs that are wrong for you, that you have, the thoughts that you have, you're not even aware of it. So we, most people think that they run their life, but we don't even run our life. Many times we take a, a decision to do something or not to do it or go somewhere or say something, and it's not us really with our, with our power that made the decision. It's a little voice in your head that says, no, no, don't do that because you might hurt, something might happen. Things that we've heard from our parents, some things, thing, a lot of beliefs that uh, we were born with, coming from other lives or, or things that we've heard since we're young, family beliefs, you know, or country beliefs, there, there are many also. So it's, uh, and we don't even know. So this is why the first goal of everything I do, my books and my everything, my teaching, is to help people become conscious. And how do you become conscious is by asking yourself questions. And then as you answer, oh, I didn't realize that. Oh, I didn't realize that. Like, for example, well, the first question you ask when you have a disease is, um, what does this, this um, physical problem stop me from doing or being in my regular life? So whatever is the answer that, like before I said, digesting the food, let's say I cannot eat some food or uh, I cannot uh, walk long because my legs are sore. And so it, whatever the answer is, it, right away you get, you become conscious of a need of yours. So because I remember for a long time I thought that if I, my legs start to hurt, well, I, my, my, my body is telling me it's time to rest. Mm -hmm. So I would sit down to rest my legs. 
but my legs, the hurt in my legs stopped me from finishing the work I needed to do. So actually my need was to finish the work I needed to do. So see, it was completely the opposite to what logically people think. And, uh, but it's the way of thinking behind that I have to change. Not, it's not what I do physically that's not good for me. It's what's beyond. And this is what people become conscious of uh, with different questions like that. Are there uh, things that stop us from being ourselves? Every time it's not going right in our life, and no matter what uh, area it is, whether it's uh, sexual or money or professional or whatever, um, it's, it's always related to one of the five wounds. Uh, rejection, abandonment, humiliation, uh, betrayal, and injustice. And each of these wounds is, um, is being fed with all these beliefs we have. So if in one lifetime we have, most of us have at least two wounds that are more, more important and uh, that affect our life more. So that means that we have many, many more beliefs attached to, that, to those wounds. So that's why most of the time we stop being ourselves. And that's the name of my book, The Five Wounds That Stop You From Being Yourself. Because uh, like uh, me, I was the, the wound of injustice. And how many times did I do something because I wanted to be a fair mother or a just mother or, or spouse or whatever or, or uh, the, f with my employees and, and, and actually I was being unfair to a lot of other people trying to be so fair with one or I was being unfair to myself, you see. Uh, it was my wound directing my, my, my gesture or my decision. What is fear and how do we overcome it? Oh wow, that's a two-day workshop. <laughs> Oh my, well, fear is, uh, it, it comes from, the, the first fear starts when you, 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 one of your wounds is being touched. Huh? You fear because you, 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 it, it hurts. So then you start to, oh, I have to be careful because I don't want to hurt again like that. So I, in the future, I will not do this or that. So actually fear, is, uh, is the belief that we entertain, it's part of our ego, huh? because our ego, like it's our ego is running us instead of uh, ourself, our inner self. And uh, the, all these different beliefs in the ego are convinced that they are protecting us with the fear. Because when, once, before we started to believe in that, we were so afraid, we thought that we could not cope with this kind of, of uh, of um, hurt or uh, pain that, the, like let's say you're, uh, you're two or three years old and uh, you, you are very rejected by your mom and, uh, and she's always pushing you aside and uh, you're a little girl and because she, she does, she's so busy with her favorite son that you know, she pushes aside her daughter and daughter, she hurts so much. She thinks she cannot cope with that so she starts doing all kinds of things to ignore that pain or try to, uh, to be really nice or whatever she does. And uh, because at that moment, at three years old, you don't know how to deal with this pain. And you don't see the whole picture. You don't see that the mother is rejecting her daughter because daughter is too much like her and she rejects herself. So she said, oh my God, my daughter is just like me. So, you know, she, she does, she's not doing it because she's a bad mother. She's just doing it because the little girl is it's a mirror. reminder, you know, is a mirror to her wound. And uh, so this is why we, we start very young and with this belief, oh no, I must, I must not talk back. I must not make too much noise because, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to be rejected. So, so then, you know, 20, 30, 40 years later, the, 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 the woman is still believing the same thing. This is where we go wrong because later on, we're not the same person. We can deal with that. We can look at it a different way. And, but, Nobody knows that. They, 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 just, they just took the, uh, got into the habit of 
never saying a word, just being very quiet, don't bother anybody, just, just be a nice person, and then everybody loves you, nobody will reject you. And uh, so fear is actually uh, the, uh, a creation of, uh, of our mental body, and it's part of our ego, but is convinced that it's helping you not to suffer. And it's us in our inner power that must convince this part of us, you know, like uh, we all have like little beings in our, made with mental energy, and we, it's uh, up to us to say, now, okay, you may be right, maybe if I dare talk, say what I have to say, maybe somebody will not like it, will reject me. But don't worry, I'm not a three-year-old anymore, I can cope with it, and I, I will not die, I promise you. So just stay aside and let me live my life because I can't do that anymore, just always be so nice because I'm afraid to be rejected. So you see, the person talks to the fear and, um, and starts getting ready to, to use her inner power. So and it works. It really works. It really works. It was one thing that you said about guilt that really caught my attention because you said something like uh, we shouldn't feel guilty for things we didn't intend, for accident. Let's go to the extremes. What if there are accidents, like really accident, real accidents? I overspeed, I hit three people, they die. Not guilty? <laughs> Well, uh, guilt has never helped anybody because uh, guilt is the biggest source of karma. So a person that dies with many guilts but just has to keep coming back all the time to overcome that because I believe that um, nobody in when they're in their heart Nobody really wants to hurt anybody. The person who got really drunk or the person that started to overspeed for some reason, there was something else behind that. There was a big, uh, uh, maybe a big hurt. The person just, uh, uh, maybe a man just caught his wife, you know, in bed with somebody else and he leaves the house in such a, a big uh, state of mind, a terrible state of mind, that he's overspeeds. Like, I'm not trying to excuse the person. I'm trying to see that, that the intention of that person was not to kill people. I come with new way of looking at things to stop feeling guilty it, it creates so many diseases it creates so many pro uh, relationship problems and and the, the, the we, we can be sorry about things we, we we don't agree with it I said I feel bad about things happening like that but even if the person who killed somebody in the car will that help the person that's dead if the person spends the rest of their life feeling guilty starting to drink because they feel so guilty and uh, and being in a bad mood and being sick and sick and, sick and more sick and uh, it doesn't help anybody so it's not intelligent to feel guilty because uh, guilt we think that if we feel really guilty we'll not start over again and it's the opposite that happens everybody who has tried to, to stop eating chocolate because they feel guilty because it's making them gain weight, let's say. They say, I must not eat chocolate anymore. And uh, what happens? Then they lose control, then they eat the whole box. And uh, it, it doesn't help because the more you feel guilty, the more you run in a vicious circle. You start over and over and every time it gets a little bigger and bigger and you feel the guilt gets bigger and bigger and it really, hurts yourself you hurt yourself a lot with that so when when I whenever I see anything that does not help anybody well why continue with this way of thinking it's not because now with this new you know era that we have entered we Aquarian age it's um, it's the era of intelligence people must act in a way that's intelligent for them and intelligent for the surroundings which means useful you know it's uh, guilt is never useful it just kills you <laughs> What about 
about, uh, let's take the other side of the victim. Yeah. Uh, you were saying at some point, if I understood well, that uh, we attract also the accidents that happen to us, that whenever we have an accident, it's not really an accident. Yes. What if I'm just crossing the street and a car hits me and I'm, I'm, I'm crossing on green light, so yes. I didn't really want yes. to be mm -hmm. hit. That's right. What about that? Did I attract that accident? Yes, yes. Every accident is always, always there to attract attention to a big guilt we have about ourselves. Yes, it's, uh, it's uh, I mean, I've been working with that for 35 years and it's so amazing. Like uh, every, like me, I run around all the time, up and down the stairs running. And so I have fell down many times and I find myself and every time. So, uh oh, what was I thinking about? And right away I say, oh yeah, I was feeling guilty about this or that. And, and right away I get my answer. So whatever happens, if I have a, a big bruise or a cut, it heals very, very fast because I found what was my guilt and then I, I decided, I don't want to be guilty about that. I said, I didn't mean to, you know, my, my intention was good. Uh, so I, I reverse it. I start to accept it. I accept my the way that I was or have been uh, doing things and I stopped feeling guilty about that. Is this the way to change a situation we don't like? Yes, because you see, if, if you stop being feeling guilty, then you will stop attracting all these accidents. So this is why, you know, little by little in your life, uh, things, uh, bad things happen less and less to you and they're smaller all the time and you, you, you solve them much faster and you have the answers. It's, uh, um, I've been, you see, I have the, the, the chance that I've been teaching and practicing that for so many years and I have seen so many thousands of people that I have been see, seeing like for many years in a row, like for example, in different workshops, or I, I, I watch like my employees. I have employees who work with me for 20 years, and I see the difference from one year to the other, and it's so beautiful to see how life gets better and better all the time. What does it mean, acceptance? Acceptance is just go with it, just with no judgment or good or bad. No, just being, just seeing. I did that, okay, maybe I hit my kid, I lost patience with my child once, but it was, it was my wound was too, too raw. It was, it was a, a one wound that was being touched too much and uh, I reacted very much. Like, uh, I'm not a bad person, I'm just a human being with wounds that I have suffering like other people. Like, um, let's say if I had a, I don't know, a big, on, on my foot and uh, I cover it with you know with a uh, bandage and or my shoe nobody sees the sore because I don't want to bother with it I don't heal it I don't look at it I just have this big sore and you you happen to go by me and you hardly touch my f my feet my foot but I ow you hurt me like well did you hurt me no because it's me you touch one of my wound that I don't want to hear I don't want to look after it so I have, we have people think other people hurt them all the time and then when when I if you do that and if I, I say ow and I go like that and I put my thumb right through your eye now I hurt you in my reaction of the suffering I I made you blind in one eye. Did I intend to do that? No, it was hurting so much that I had this big reaction that hurt the other person. So we're not bad people, we're just humans with wounds. One last question and a very important one for us. How can we become better persons? Like um, two things that you can tell us that can help us now. Just practice the the uh, acceptance, the you know, the unconditional love. Just whatever you. As soon as you start hitting yourself on the head, you know, say, "Oh, I should not have done that. I should not have said that." Just say, "Oops, one moment." When I said it, it's because it just came out. I. I don't know why it came out like that. Okay, maybe it hurt the other person, but it, that's the way it came out. And it just practice and all the little things 
just to say to accept yourself and just it, it's like you put your, uh, yourself outside of yourself you watch yourself that you just did that because if you did something that you don't agree with uh, maybe you said something bad to somebody or so, it's just a part of you that was hurting at that moment so you just watch all these little parts of you that are hurting and one day these wounds will start to heal and and they heal all the time with all these little actions of love the the, the wounds are healing by themselves mm. Thank you very much for this interview, for your time and uh, for everything you said to us. And I hope to see you again in Romania. We very much need so. Yeah. Thank you very much for having, uh, for having me and for your good questions. <laughs> Thank you. Doamnelor și domnilor, vă mulțumesc că ați fost alături de noi. Vă doresc o zi minunată, o viață minunată cu bine.